welcome everybody to another workshop introducing the three minute thesis um, event, I guess, rather than a competition uh, within the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at McMaster University. Let me suggest uh, for attendees, again, the meeting is being recorded and, you know, keep your cameras off and microphone keep mute unless you're asking a question or unless you're one of our guests. So like our guests to have their cameras on and can be unmuted and jump in whenever, whenever necessary. But um, in general attendees, you're, you're all absolutely invited to interrupt at any time. Just jump in, don't be shy. Uh, it's very informal and um, please, please, please ask uh, questions. So engaging real people in three realistic minutes. I can see Aaron smiling at that title. Um, and I'm doing this with uh, Danny Shields, the instructional assistant for this uh, course. Uh, Danny, why don't you say a few words about yourself? Sure. So um, uh, I completed my undergrad at McMaster in electrical and biomedical engineering. Uh, and then I went on to do my master's of engineering at McMaster uh, in Dr. Bruce's lab, uh, the auditory engineering lab. And we're currently working on um, a project to biophysically model an auditory nerve. Um, and I, I ate this course last semester and I'll be your instructional assistant uh, this coming semester. Yeah, we, we've been doing quite well, uploading all kinds of videos to YouTube and it's been a good experience. Erin, our guest from Massachusetts, introduce yourself. Uh, hi, uh, so, so I'm for now an assistant professor um, of mathematics at the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts. Uh, as I mentioned, it's in the picturesque Berkshire Mountains of Western Massachusetts. Um, I've been here since the year that I finished my PhD, which was 2016. Um, I did that at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, a little bit further east, but also in Massachusetts, um, where uh, my connection to the microwave community is working on multi-physics problems. Um, so, so I'm making computer simulations of a process called sintering, um, which can take place in conventional ovens, but is much greener if it takes place in microwave ovens. Um, so I was modeling that process. Um, so happy to meet all of you. Um, I'm, I'm here in my capacity as a 3MT organizer with John Bandler. Um, so we, we kind of noticed um, together that some of the technical talks were 15 minutes long and that felt like way too long because they were deadly boring. Um, so we kind of made it our mission to, um, to introduce 3MT as sort of a Trojan horse as a way of uh, getting the ideas of sticky presentations or of um, presentations whose ideas stay with you um, more effectively and longer um, to, to get people talking about these at IMS. So we're, we're delighted that it's spreading through universities as well and happy to meet all of you and to hear about your research. Thanks, thanks, Erin. And the Trojan horse, that's our first metaphor of the day. Um, that was your metaphor. You came up with that. I came up with that? Okay. <laughs> you did, yeah. I, years ago, yeah. <laughs> when oh, we first okay. pitched this, okay. we said Maybe, we hoped it yeah, would be a Trojan horse. Be, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, and we also are delighted to have a guest from our own department, a, a three-minute uh, thesis presenter from last year, Sarah Zendabudi. Sarah, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate of EC department at, at McMaster University, and uh, my research is on the design of optimal distributed scalar quantizers using machine learning. Uh, and in my research, I use uh, data, labeled data, to find out how to uh, optimally design a scalar quantizers in a way that it better serves the classification goals. So um, I have been uh, in the 3MT last year, and I was honored to be selected as one of the commendations for uh, the presentation. And nice to meet you, everyone. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks. We'll be playing. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be playing her video later and talking about it. So, okay. By way of introduction, before I turn it over to Tim and to Ian for a few words of encouragement, do you dread presentations like this? Well, don't let yours be one of them. Okay. I mean, we all dread Zoom presentations. One suggestion that might make your uh, experience a little bit better, I, I would sort of suggest your settings should be hide non-video participants and get yourself into gallery view, side-by-side -side mode, 
and in which case you will actually see a, you will see an invisible or slightly visible partition that you can move left and right to sh shrink the uh, slide or increase the size of the slide and uh, so on. Again, um, people don't often mention that, but that's a nice feature that you can you can use. So I have a whole bunch of people to acknowledge over the last few years working on three minute thesis at McMaster University and, and elsewhere. You may recognize some of these names. Some of you are there in, in, uh, in the acknowledgements. Um, so just before we talk about the agenda, let me please turn this over to Tim Davidson, the department chair, just to say a few words of encouragement. Okay, welcome, welcome everybody. And uh, let me just say that I am really looking forward to uh, the the 3MT event that will happen at uh, the end of this this course, and and to witness the, the the truly remarkable transformations that have happened in the past. Um, I know that many of you uh, will be a little bit shy about giving presentations and that you may be concerned about being pulled up on a small technical detail in your presentation. And you, you may let the concern about that overwhelm uh, your desire to be able to communicate the core ideas of what it is that you are doing. And one of the really fabulous things about this exercise is it enables you to focus on the core principles of what it, is that you're doing and to communicate those big ideas and to communicate them in a confident and engaging way that will really get uh, your audience interested. And it is with the sort of coaching provided by, by John and Danny and, and the other people who will be involved, it has been truly remarkable to watch what students have been able to do. Those students were just as concerned and just as nervous as you are right now but three or four weeks later, they are just remarkably fluent and engaging presenters. So dive into this. It is probably the, 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 the best value for money in terms of enhancing your career prospects of anything that you will do here at McMaster. So, so, so dive into it, have fun with it, uh, embarrass yourself in the short term, and then just do a wonderfully engaging presentation at the end. I'm really looking forward to that. Thanks, Tim. Value for money. That's what this is all about. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Uh, Ian, would you like to add a few words? I think you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you hear me now? OK, great. Uh, so I'd like to add my thanks to uh, John and Danny and uh, Aaron and Sarah. Thanks for the uh, effort you're putting in uh, to helping our students with uh, developing their communication skills. And um, I want to build on something that Aaron mentioned about the idea of taking uh, 3MT presentation skills and having that translate uh, to uh, other types of presentations. And I, I can say I've definitely witnessed this. Um, so not just Danny, but other graduate students in my lab uh, who've, uh, who've been involved in EC 790, and some of them have gone on to uh, faculty of engineering and university level uh, 3MT competitions, that um, the, the confidence uh, that it's given them uh, in giving technical presentations, uh, uh, as well as, as 3MT type presentations has been remarkable. Um, the insight into how to present well, how to present in an engaging way, how to be confident um, has, has, has really been remarkable. So um, yeah, please do, please do see this as, as, a, as mentioned, a way um, to, to not just help you present to a general audience, but to any audience and to really develop your overall presentation skills that as uh, Tim said, um, are gonna help you in so many ways in your uh, future studies and careers. So uh, please do engage with this, this process. Um, and I, I too look forward to, to seeing your presentations in April. 
Great. Thank, th thank, thanks so much, Ian. That, that's really great. And again, Ian and Tim, I know you have a busy schedule, so if you disappear, we won't uh, hold it against you. Um, have you done this? You've done this so many times before that uh, you've heard all of this. So, okay, let me turn over to the agenda. Um, you've probably been reading some of this while you heard those uh, uh, kind words. We'll be talking about um, uh, virtual versus digital versus in-person presentations and what the differences and similarities might be. <clears throat> we'll play two videos and discuss uh, certain key aspects of those videos. We'll spend quite a little, quite a bit of time on so-called core images, the composition of the slide, the formulation of titles, and um, the idea of authenticity versus theatricality. Should you be theatrical and just gesture, you know, grandly as if you're doing a Shakespeare play, or should you be true to yourself? So uh, those are all issues we'll, we'll deal with. And again, as I mentioned at the beginning, please anybody unmute yourself, open up your camera and, and just jump in with any question at any time, please don't, fe don't feel shy. Um, so there's a lot of uh, things we could be talking about. And if we did, we would be here almost forever. But some of the key things that we'll mention is the idea of story, telling a story, persuading your audience, overcoming their biases, and perhaps even overcoming your own, gaining trust, fear, the, 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 your own fear of pres presenting, succeeding, whatever, all kinds of fears. The subtext that is carried by your words. Are you using a metaphor like Trojan horse that Aaron used uh, earlier on and blamed me for it? Um, again, theatricality, authenticity, slide composition, how should you do that? Above all, how do you respect your audience? And uh, one of the things that is very, very rarely handled, admitting setbacks. Almost nobody seems to want to admit setbacks. It's amazing. We always hear good news. We never actually hear that something has failed, pushed you back a few months, but you know, Part of drama is the idea of a setback. It's overcoming setbacks is what creates heroes and heroines and so on. So there are all kinds of different venues in which a presentation can take place. In a physical classroom, in a huge auditorium, it, would it be in an online meeting like this one? Uh, would it be one-to-one -one in person uh, as in an interview? Could it be an online interview? Could it be to a recording camera? I'm right now looking into my camera. Is this camera recording me? The answer is yes. Or is it to an off-camera interview? You've seen those interviewers on TV where, where interviewers and interviewees are facing each other, but not actually looking at the camera. Or to an on-camera interviewer. Or is it a voiceover as in voice over PowerPoint, for example. You know, th there are subtle differences that you need to master depending upon those things. And as I say, please interrupt any time and, and it includes the guests. Um, uh, at some point, I'll ask the guests to jump in directly. Now, one of the things that comes up an awful lot, but is somehow rarely covered is how do we overcome language, articulation, and pronunciation barriers? We have students that come from everywhere. We're all speaking English. We all speak English with different accents, with different backgrounds. Um, so how do we overcome issues of communication to a general audience? Not to your family who knows you, not to your best friend who's, who's heard you speak for the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years, but to total strangers, how do you do that? Well, in a three minute thesis presentation, you need to choose your opening words carefully. I really think that the first 10, 20 seconds of your opening, you should choose your words carefully because you are also getting the audience to tune in to your way of pronouncing things. And you want to give them some simple, easily identifiable words that they can gradually acclimatize. I think we've often been there where 
we hear somebody speak and the, initially we somehow don't quite understand what they're saying. But as time goes on, we gradually seem to understand more and more. And we wonder whether, you know, has the audio quality increased? It's probably, the audio quality is probably the same. It's just that you've kind of tuned yourself to the way they, they speak. Anyway, choosing words carefully, choosing metaphors carefully, speaking more slowly than you normally do, being redundant. And notice, by the way, this slide is highly redundant. There's a lot of overlapping uh, um, recommendations. Repeating troublesome, unexpected, or important words. There's nothing worse than an important word or a word that you think is important that you hear just once and is never repeated or, or, or repeated later on in some other context. You're writing a script, get your grammar check. It, it really is quite important. And do practice with non-native English speakers. You know, find a student who comes from a totally different region of the world than you do perhaps, and practice your presentation on them. Anyway, enough for the moment. Danny, Sarah, Aaron, you want to jump in a little bit on any of the things that I've spoken about? Yeah, I would just add into um, with, uh, practicing with non-native English speakers is really important, but also um, practicing with people of different backgrounds. So we're, the goal of this presentation is to give a non-technical uh, presentation to a general audience. So make sure when you're practicing, you practice with a diverse group of individuals and make sure you're conveying your ideas in an easily understandable way. Erin, any, any thoughts? Do you, you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I would just say that, that it can seem scary and it can seem very daunting to be giving a presentation that's in a language that's not your native one. Um, it, it really helps to practice. And the earlier you start practicing, the more comfortable you will be by the time you give your presentation. So practice early, practice with um, a group of people, um, ideally whose native language is different than yours. And um, ideally with, with people who have as many different native languages as you can get. Um, I know that in most engineering departments, it's not hard to find people from a whole bunch of different places. <laughs> Um, so that works in your favor, actually. Um, in math departments, it's just as true. Um, but yeah, practicing is good. Um, I, I see it here on the slide, um, repeat troublesome, unexpected, or important words. Um, and that's not to say just, you know, repeat it four times in a row the first time you say it. It's to say, work it into your script several different times so the audience hears it come up organically in context several different times. Um, that can only help you. Um, I remember I had a non-native speaker of English teaching me partial differential equations as an undergrad, and it took me months to figure out what the term forcing term was. Um, this, this professor just could not say that, and it didn't appear anywhere in the book. It turned out to be a you know, non-zero right-hand side, but, um, <laughs> but she always called it this thing that I didn't understand, forcing term, <laughs> <laughs> right? So, yeah. um, so sometimes even you know, repeating it, if it's just in one context, um, sometimes that doesn't help. So try repeating it in multiple contexts. Yeah, good. Sarah, do you want to add anything to that? Or? Um, just a small thing. For me, as someone with non-native English, like I don't have a background in English. So um, if you don't know a word or you, you're not comfortable with pronouncing a word, just try using simpler words so that you don't yeah, like you don't um, get a stress when you're trying to uh, present it. So if you cannot explain something in very different words, just use simpler words instead to be easy and to be comfortable to pronounce it. Yeah, good. That's a great, great thing. Well, we'll come back to this. You'll hear more about this uh, later on. And one of the things that's important with the, you know, the kind of uh, event that we have in mind, three minute thesis, um, don't be ill prepared, don't rush. Um, three, minute, three minutes is not the target and you're not supposed to cram as many words as possible into your script. So don't rush, don't run out of time. If, if it were a competition, you'd be disqualified. Avoid speaking in a monotone, make variations in your voice. But because we're going to be doing this virtually, one of the things about speaking is don't let your voice drop too much because it's quite possible that those words may disappear 
through the audio internet uh, system. And don't be distant. Again, we'll come back to this as well. Don't swallow words. By swallowing words, what I mean is you, 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 you articulate a sentence and, for, and at the very end of the sentence, the words sort of disappear. I, I call that swallowing words. Your name is important. If you do give your name, but don't sabotage it, make sure it's memorable. And that first impression is uh, really, really important. Uh, I think we, we've all been told about first impressions being important and actually, sadly they are. I can give you many anecdotes about my own experiences where you know, a first impression or a bad first impression can take maybe 30 years to correct. Not, not 30 months or 30 weeks, but 30 years. So I, I guess I'm sort of confessing that I gave somebody a bad impression once. <laughs> so I don't, think anyone, else, I don't <laughs> think anyone else here is old enough to have given a bad impression 30 years ago <laughs> that, that makes any sense. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> unless you were, gave a bad impression when you were a baby. Okay, the three minute thesis requirements. There's two fundamental requirements. Do not exceed three minutes. But remember, it's not a target. You can speak for 30 seconds. You can speak for one minute. You can speak for 1.5 minutes. Uh, it's not a, three minutes is not the target. And one static PowerPoint slide. So there's no animations, no second slide, no videos and uh, so on. That, that's the bottom line. And we, we, this, all this will unfold as we go through the various workshops in the, in the coming few weeks. Above all, you really have to cut jargon. And uh, ext let's just take three examples of extreme jargon, jargon that is in common use but misunderstood, and, and jargon that's in general usage that you can use because people have associations with them. For example, I would regard primitivity as extreme jargon in terms of the general public. I would say resonator may be understood by the general public, but it certainly may not be understood in, in a, the kind of context that you might put it in. Again, the word Bluetooth may be in general usage, but if you ask someone from the general public define Bluetooth, they would be hard pressed to give you a technical presentation. So be very careful about using words um, that might be in general usage and yet still be jargon um, and may not be as understood as you think they are. And then of course, extreme jargon that you can see on the left-hand side of your screen. <clears throat> so no jargons and avoid acronyms. Acronyms are really, um, you know, unless it's an acronym like um, ABC, maybe ABC or CNN, you can have those acronyms that might be understood. But in general, I would avoid acronyms. I would just, I would just give them in their expanded form, give those terms in their expanded form. Don't get stuck in details. As, as you may see later on, particularly when we watch those videos, you know, they, they often start off very well, they end very well, but somewhere in the middle, they sometimes just somehow get lost. And you, you know, as a, as a viewer, you, 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 you may get lost. Uh, use metaphors, which are understood. And again, metaphors may mean different things in different cultures and languages. So be a little bit careful. Always try to include a human story. What's a human story? It's your story. It's a relative story. It's an imaginary person's, a fictional person's story. Uh, now, under human stories, you might even have a, an animal story, a, a creature. I should maybe instead of human, I might say creature story. In Aaron's case, it could be a bee, it could be a chicken, it could be a cat, right? <coughs> okay. Now, you need to memorize your presentation. And when you memorize, you know, authenticity might be at risk, which means you might sound robotic when you're delivering this. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not turning you into actors. I'm trying to turn you into who you really are, not, not somebody else, but who you are. And make sure you always give the audience, your audience, 
uh, something tangible to go away with, not, not head scratching, but something tangible. Now, we're going to be doing this um, online virtual presentation, and you can take this in kind of subliminally as, as I speak. There's all kinds of uh, wrong assumptions, technical limitations, microphone quality. And by the way, when we start working on this, microphone quality is one of the things I'll be hitting most of you on. And uh, the audio quality of a presentation is, is really, really critical, more important even than the video. I recommend 120 words per minute maximum, except for those speakers that are crystal clear, use short, well-known words, and, and can, can, can be understood at higher, a higher word rate than that. Now, we'll come to this idea as well in a, in a little while, the idea of a core image, uh, and a, some kind of a core image that is part of the audience takeaway, and integrate that core image with your speech somehow indicate your qualifications, either with the logo of your lab or university or your name or the fact that you're a PhD student, somehow indicate that you can be trusted professionally. Um, story format is really, really important. And we'll come back to actual examples. I don't want to define it for you here. We'll come to general, to specific examples, I should say, shortly. Again, try to be specific in your examples rather than general. While you're memorizing a script, stand, move around. You know, don't, don't sit or stand in the same spot while trying to remember your, your presentation. Rehearse with people who haven't heard you uh, and don't be satisfied with kindness. Your friends will be very kind. They'll say, oh yeah, that's great. And then they'll go on and do their stuff. And you will say, really, that's it? That's the only comment you have, that I'm great? Uh, so. And again, avoid, right, right now I'm reading the script off the screen. You do not want to do this. You know, your eyes moving to and fro, reading the screen like this is easily detectable and does not feel like you're engaging the audience. It feels like you're reading. You know, pause. One of the things that is so rarely used is the idea of not speaking, of being silent for a little while. Silence and pauses are used for dramatic effect in films, on theater. Um, in your case, you have up to three minutes. You can be silent for a whole minute if you want to be. Totally, just be silent. But if you're silent for a whole minute and the audience is there waiting, you, the, the, the stakes are gonna increase and increase and increase and you better deliver something worthwhile for the audience being silent for that long. And again, listen to your audience as you speak. And as I speak now, I'm kind of, trying to pretend that I'm in your minds, listening to me speaking, and, out, and do I think I'm coming across, rather than simply speaking at the audience, sort of speak with the audience, if that makes any sense. Learn to be in the moment, and what being in the moment means, that if something goes wrong, if a canary falls down off your ceiling, or something falls off the ceiling due to the canary. <laughs> I see Aaron uh, shrugging there or kind of being very upset. Um, you know, I just wonder why the canary fell. Um, well, like, well <laughs> exactly. Maybe, maybe you shot at it or something anyway, whatever. All right, you're doubling down on the violence. All right, um, that's, <laughs> that's one true. way to do it. <laughs> the point is, if the canary flies across the screen, I mean, look at it. I mean, it's some, something is happening in real time. Make yeah, that, I mean, that is a good uh, point, right? There are always unexpected things, well, yeah. always. There are sometimes unexpected things that happen during a presentation. And for you to, to completely shut down over it and get nervous and stop is not a great reaction to have. But <laughs> for you to um, pretend that nothing happened, right? Pretend that nothing is on fire right behind you also right. looks weird to your audience if something is on fire right behind you. Yeah. So, I mean, I suppose do what you would naturally do, um, which is generally good advice for speaking. Do what you would naturally do. <laughs> right. I mean, if you were in person in an auditorium and uh, somebody in the front row fell off fell off their seat onto the floor, you would not continue speaking. 
You just wouldn't, no matter what you were doing. Anyway, so be kind to the judges and viewers. I mean, ma ma make it easy for them to, 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 to appreciate your presentation. And as I've already said before, script redundancies help combat, uh, combat uh, technical issues. Now try to connect with your slide. If this was in person and the slide was here behind me, I mean, somehow it, you know, the audience is wondering what's that slide doing? What's there that is related to your presentation? Try to interact with your slide in one way or another. In our virtual uh, world, um, don't look at the screen. It's obvious that you're looking down. It's very unnatural. Um, it doesn't feel as, as I am doing right now. Make your presentation, deliver your presentation right into the camera as I am doing now. I'm looking right into the camera. And keep the camera at eye level. Uh, make sure that vertical lines behind you are vertical, unlike Erin, Erin who's looking down at her uh, camera right now because the camera is looking up at her. But that, that's okay, Erin, uh, uh, we will we'll forgive you. Yes, but uh, make sure you're not falling down off the screen. You need to fill. What, see where the top of my head is? I'm kind of filling the, filling the frame. Don't leave too much space above your head. Anyway, if you, those are cosmetics, but you know, in terms of creating an impression, I, it's hugely important. You may be interviewed uh, via Zoom for a, for a job, and those first impressions uh, you know, really, really uh, count. Um, and you can look away. You don't have to stare fixedly into the camera. You can look away. You know, if you if you're thinking about something or giving the illusion that you're thinking about something, there's nothing wrong with, you know, looking away as long as it feels natural. And as I say, acknowledge a distraction in real time. Sit away from the camera to reveal hand gestures. I always suggest to people, make sure your elbows are visible. I mean, I'm approximately a meter from my camera here and uh, my elbows are visible. Um, your backdrop is part of the impression that you're giving. Compose the space behind you. Um, and again, as I mentioned, face and eye movements are important, particularly if it looks like you're reading. Rehearse, record, watch, rehearse, record, watch. Rehearse yourself. We all hate ourselves. We all hate the sound of our own voices. I haven't met anybody who says, I have a great voice. I love to hear my recorded voice. I hate my recorded voice. Erin, do you like your recorded voice? I hate my recorded voice. Yeah, Good. yeah. So one time I was teaching a class over Zoom and a student who thought she had her microphone off um, actually commented on my voice to another student. <laughs> so I know that I'm not the only person who hates my voice. Uh, but what can you do? It's the one you've got. So Sarah, what about you? Do you love your the sound of your voice recorded? Of course not. I don't think so. <laughs> Except for the singers, maybe, but rather than that, I don't think anyone likes his or her voice. So. Yeah, but but that's what you're inflicting on other people. You should you should listen to yourself so that you know what you're inflicting. <laughs> okay, okay. So talking about voices, let's jump into case studies, and uh, in these two case studies that we're going to look, we're going to be watching and then examining a little bit and commenting on. Look for metaphor, look for believability, of course, trustworthiness uh, in that sense. Look for purposeful gestures. I mean, I'm making gestures now. Are these gestures that I'm doing now, are they purposeful? Do they mean anything? Uh, look for the speaker engaging with the slide or images in verbally or in some other way. Look for dramatic pauses. Does the speaker pause or is it one continuous diatribe? You know, we don't often notice those pauses. The reason you don't often notice the pauses when someone is speaking well is because it's, it, it feels natural. Something that feels natural is not something that you notice. But you do notice if somebody is speaking monotonically in a continuous way. Make it relate, is it relatable? Is there humor? Is there the element of story in it? And what's the audience takeaway? So let's, let's watch um, Mahmoud Wadi's three-minute thesis from 2020. Uh, he was a second place winner at the IEEE Microwave Week uh, conference. Um, and uh, let's watch this. 
you can you can see this thing later on uh, uh, on YouTube as well if you want to. It's it's really well worth studying. So let I'll play this and we'll we'll an analyze it on the other side. Imagine if all rain was wasted. That doesn't sound right. Thankfully, this doesn't really happen to rain. But the same happens right now to power. Wireless networks, 5G, even Wi-Fi, waste power. And our electronics are thirsty for power. You don't hear anyone saying, I'm satisfied with my battery life. Because we dream of a sustainable, connected world. A world where you don't have to charge and replace batteries every single day. Imagine charging hundreds of batteries. Think about their disposal, the waste, and our planet. This is not the connected world we want. My name is Mahmoud Wagi, and my research brings recycling to rescue. And no, not household recycling. I recycle power, power from radio waves. When you make a phone call, power is scattered as radio waves. I design antennas that collect radio waves and convert them into power. Clean DC power. Isn't free power great? But if power is really around us, why is no one using it? The power is thousands of times smaller than what your phone consumes. And I have tuned my antennas to absorb very small signals. My solution to collect more power is inspired by rain. Filling a glass from raindrops doesn't sound very that significant. But try and fill 100 glasses, and it becomes valuable. And it's the same with radio waves. OK, I know radio waves don't fall out of clouds. But radio waves do spread in a similar way to clouds and rain. So if you think of antennas as glasses, more antennas equals more power, but only, only if we combine the power from many antennas. Here's a problem. Large antenna arrays are bulky and expensive. My antennas are flexible, light, and cheap. My next step is to fit my antennas into wearable fabrics, creating large area, low cost radio power collectors. So your very own t-shirt can substitute for a battery. I also make my antennas more dynamic to recycle small and large signals simultaneously. My goal is to get you to forget about your batteries. But please, don't forget your umbrellas. Thank you. Good, that was, that was great. Um, so let's let's just look at his opening and closing, and then we'll open this up for a bit of a discussion. Um, so Mahmoud opens with what happened there. Okay, went back. Um, both hands raised in contemplation. Imagine if all the rain was wasted. And notice, by the way, the pauses that I put in. The, these stage directions that I have here, like pauses, emphatic, uh, et cetera, um, these are things that I added in having watched the video. But you could you can put those into your script and, and, and practice with those in your script. But anyway, uh, having said that, imagine if all the rain was wasted. That doesn't sound right. Thankfully, this doesn't really happen to rain. I mean, th that is kind of a mysterious. It's unexpected. Who would imagine somebody in a in a microwave symposium would talk about rain being wasted? It certainly would attract the people's attention at that conference. So he talks about rain. So rain is somehow the hero of the of the story. My goal is to forget get you to forget about your batteries, but please. Don't forget your umbrellas. Again, he comes back to the idea of rain. Um, let me open this up. Uh, Danny, why don't you say a few words and then we'll, we'll get Sarah and Aaron to add a few words. Uh, 
Yeah, what I think is really amazing with the script is if you read the beginning, just the beginning two sentences and the last two sentences we're looking at here, you kind of get the whole gist of the presentation. You really don't even need um, that inner part because he's bookended his presentation so well. And it's so important because people um, remember the first thing you say and the last thing you say. So it's really important you get as much information as you can in there. And he's done it in such an elegant way here. Right, right. Erin, do you want to jump in on this uh, with a few comments? Yeah, I think Danny is just right. Um, it, it, it is important to bookend your presentation with something that's memorable, but it's also important to, to give a sufficient amount of detail, which Mahmoud did in the middle of his presentation. Um, I also um, you know, like that he looked into the future uh, and said that, you know, I envision you being able to put on your t-shirt and use this as some device that will recycle radio waves. Um, you know, it might not be something that you're able to do right now, um, but, but the audience can envision this. It's something tangible. They know what a t-shirt is. They're absolutely flabbergasted by one that can recycle radio waves on top of everything. Um, so I, I think giving something tangible is also, um, is also a useful, Thing. I wouldn't even call it a metaphor. I guess I would just call it something concrete that the audience can envision. Right. And by the way, you may recall, if you watch that video again later on, he uses his hands very deliberately. You know, there are these movements that give a sort of a staccato uh, quality to, to his words. When, when you do this, it's, it's very difficult to go fast or to speak fast when you're actually using your your hands deliberately. And he does use pauses quite quite effectively. He uses mm -hmm. pauses and, and gestures quite effectively. And you may not notice that if I didn't point this out or if we didn't point it out, because it feels natural. At least it feels natural to me. Sarah, any, any other thoughts on this? Um, Rather than everything that everyone said, I think um, Mahmoud's presentation, uh, one of the good points about his presentation was the gesture, of course. And one other thing for me was he carefully connected all the parts of his presentation together. So I wasn't lost anywhere in, in his presentation. He started very well. He connected what he started with to the main idea of his research, and then he finished very well with the same idea. So connecting the uh, paragraphs of the script is something that really stood out for me for uh, Mahmoud's presentation. And this is something uh, I personally had issues with at the beginning of my 3MT seminar, my 3MT preparations. Uh, and then over time, I was able to uh, find out ways to connect the paragraphs, but Again, uh, Mahmoud's job was, was very, very good, I think. And I really, I used uh, his uh, presentation for my preparation. Great, thank, thanks so much. Listen, the audience members, you guys, uh, at some point, we're going to be seeing you and hearing you. One of you should be brave enough to ask a question. Unmute yourself and ask a question uh, or, or about any aspect of anything we've spoken, spoken about so far the video or anything else? No? Um, uh, I wanted to ask a question, but um, so uh, what we are here, what we are trying is just a presentation, like practice. We are not really trying to explain what we are doing because like uh, normally all of the things that we are doing is super complicated. And if you want to simplify it to the way that everyone understands, we can probably like this one, we can just make it in three sentences and then the rest will be just like some like, um, uh, pre-comments and post-comments of, of what we are doing. Like, this is what we are searching for, right? Am I getting the correct vibe here? Well, I think what, what you should, the takeaway for this is not that the middle is not important, but the beginning, the beginning allows, the, allows the audience to somehow relate to what you were doing. There needs to be some kind of a relationship where you set up, you set up the beginning of some kind of a story and then you gradually swing into the, let's call it the, the essence of what your research is all about. And then you, then you come back again to this relatable um, uh, uh, conclusion where you, 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 you try to bookend what you're talking about. 
again, the opening of a story, the closing of a story are incredibly important. So is what happens in the middle. Okay. Um, but we'll, we'll, yes. we'll see any, so Erin, go ahead. Yeah, so sorry, just to jump in here, um, I, I want to go back to the concrete example of Mahmoud's um, talk. He, he won an award for this, and I don't think he would have won any awards at all if the entirety of his talk had been, I recycle radio waves, happy to take questions. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, you can sum up a whole lot of novels with just one sentence, right? You're like, the girl dies in the end or whatever that doesn't mean you shouldn't read the novel. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't listen just for what's in the middle to a three minute thesis talk. Without the middle of Mahmoud's talk, I don't think that he would have won any prize for it. I, I think what one of the good things about his talk was was that there was a middle of it. Um, right. So it, it's kind of comprehensible no matter what resolution you smush it down to, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, uh, so the idea is not to explain how to, it's just that they show the concept. It's not like, because uh, in, 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 at least in my mind, what is fun about what we do is how we do it. If we don't explain how to just give the concept that, okay, I am designing this motor for this application and just put some context before and after, that's just, uh, I don't see any value in that. It's a good question. Um, you know, so, so I'll go back to something that I say a lot in, in 3MT preparation or even in um, you know, getting people to understand what a 3MT is. Um, and that's that whenever you give any kind of a presentation for whatever reason, you always really want to do three things. You want to give a thorough picture of what it is you're talking about. You want to be understandable to the audience and you want to be brief but you can never do all three of those things. You need to choose two of them, right? Um, so for a three minute thesis, you are brief and you are understandable, but that means you're not gonna be able to get far into the weeds about what makes your research different than your office mate's research. For example, I assume you're working on similar things. Um, if not, then find and replace with an appropriate example. But, um, but you know, so, so, so 3MTs really can't get that far into the weeds. You're looking to be brief, you're looking to be understandable. And there is value in that. Um, in fact, most of the other people in the world um, will only be able to understand the 3MT version of your research because the other versions of your research, right? For example, the one that is thorough and understandable where you're getting rid of brevity, that's your dissertation defense. And that's gonna take an hour or two, right? Um, you're being really thorough and it's understandable to the people in your audience who also are probably some level of expert. Um, it's definitely not brief, right? And then the one that, that skews understandable um, is the one that is thorough and that is brief. And that's the 15 minute technical talk where only the other experts in your audience are gonna be able to understand it. Right. So, you know, there is value in doing a 3MT, but understand that what you're getting rid of is the thorough part. Right. Um, you're not going to be able to drill down as far as you might like. But, you know, there's some degree of empathy you've got to have with your audience as well. Right. Um, they're they're maybe not as interested in the details as you are. Um, if they were, everyone would be a PhD electrical engineer, wouldn't they? Um, but, but there's value in this, trust us. Um, and if you don't trust us, then open your eyes and talk to people who aren't also engineers. <laughs> yeah. By the way, one thing I just might want to make, make mention of is uh, he has one, one, one sentence here. My goal is to get you to forget about your batteries. I mean, think about that in, a, in, a, in an elevator pitch when you're meeting somebody who has some kind of influence is somehow in the battery business. Um, and, and, and someone gets in and says, you know, my name is Mahmoud Wagi, and my goal is to get you to forget about your batteries. Now, if that doesn't qualify as, yeah, tell me more, what do you mean? Then nothing will. So, so there's, a, there's a lot of elements of that in this presentation. Uh, it, it's really quite, quite good. Let, let's move on to Sarah's uh, video. And uh, we'll play that video. Hopefully, I won't screw this one up. And uh, we'll talk on the other side of this and analyze it. Have you ever had a brain scan with sensors around your head 
to capture brain signals, but I hope you didn't have to. But understanding brain activities can be life-changing. For example, if a computer can understand in which direction a patient is trying to move a hand, it can be used for correct movements of an artificial arm. But getting to the computer, brain signals pass through a channel with limited bandwidth. So to prevent losing important information, signals should be prepared before sending. I'm Sarah, and my work is to prepare signals by digitizing them based on their use. How? For each sensor, I use a digitizing device called quantizer. Are you wondering what is a quantizer? Well, every day you plan your time out, right? You divide the limited time you have into durations, and for each duration, you assign a work to do. Quantizers divide the sensor data range into intervals and represent all data in each interval with a single point. This way, signals will be digitized, thus readable for the computer. Designing a quantizer for sensor data means finding these intervals and points based on the available bandwidth and the system's goal. This is where my work makes a difference. To make the design faster, most approaches consider equal quantizers for all sensors, or they don't consider the application in the design. But I have found that each quantizer can be free to find its own best way to adapt. In my algorithm, each quantizer looks at other sensors and the specific result of the system to learn how to better adjust itself and find the best intervals. This way, important information can get to the computer safely. So I kept the design fast, but with much more accurate results. Hopefully, this will help patients everyday life by allowing fast and precise movements of your artificial arms. Thank you. Great, great, that was good. Yeah, I didn't turn my video off or mute myself because the last time I tried to do that, uh, it kind of affected the video, um, I had to restart. Okay, so, um, Sarah, why don't you take it, uh, you know, discuss your opening, um, what you were thinking, why you had that opening. Um, All right. Um, actually, the final script that I have is very different from what I, what I started with. And uh, my research was a bit of abstract. So it was hard at the beginning to um, be able to put it in three minutes, to explain it in three minutes. So uh, I thought about applications where my work can actually be helpful. And I used those applications to start and end my presentation. So first I started with um, some application of my research, which is with sensors. And then uh, I started with, um, have you had a brain scan so that I can follow it with uh, related sentences to show what, what exactly is my work. And step by step, I tried to uh, get to the point of the use of quantizers. Yeah, good. Now, again, notice our opening line. Have you ever had a brain scan? I mean, that, that immediately engages the audience. I mean, if she was doing this uh, in person with an audience there, she would say, have you ever had a brain scan? And, you know, she could have left out the rest of the uh, opening and, and gone straight to understanding brain activities can be life changing. I mean, you know, there are so many ways one can re-edit this if one wanted to. But understanding brain activities can be life changing. I mean, again, that is something that would engage an audience uh, right away. Um, look at her closing. So, um, talk about your closing and, and what you were trying to achieve there, sir. And then we'll get Danny and Aaron to, to jump in. Okay. Um, what I tried was to uh, 
kind of conclude my talk and my research to its application. So what, what, so what? You do this and what happens? So what happens is that information can get to the computer safely and I don't lose uh, important information. And then how does it help? It, I try to relate it to the opening, which was an application of my research. So this way, I kind of, I hope I was able to connect the parts of my uh, presentation to each other and finish it with the same idea as I opened the, the script with. Yeah, and by the way, if you may have noted, if you've been watching Sarah actually speak right now, you saw those hand gestures. You know, those are those seem pretty authentic to me. She was, I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't uh, uh, frame it by saying to the, you, the audience, watch how Sarah moves her hands. I, but I drew attention to it later on, and she uses those kinds of movements in her presentation. Um, the idea of raising sets a level with a hand and raises the other one higher. I mean, all of these things make a make a big difference. It's like Mahmoud Wagi and radio waves. Um, those gestures are really, really make the words stand out. So Aaron, you want to jump in on that? Yeah, so one thing that I really noticed that that um that you might have picked up on too, um, audience, is that um, Sarah didn't quite follow John's advice about jargon. Um, she put the word quantizer in that script and then did a wonderful job using things that everyone knows about, like chunking their time into discrete chunks and organizing it through the day, of, un of explaining what a quantizer is. Um, so, you know, I, I thought that was really impressive um, that, <laughs> that you could get around John's advice um, and still do an excellent job. <laughs> um, so, um, so that is to say, um, take every single piece of advice that anyone gives you, but especially that we're giving you today, um, with a grain of salt. Um, you could Aaron, probably I, still I give an to, excellent presentation have, without I, following 100% of it. I have to jump in there. I think if I recall correctly, Sarah's original script was was much more jargon filled than this so quantizer is i think what was left after all the other jargon was thrown out it was like a well let's uh, let's at least leave leave one word of jargon in there i know we can't resist can we like we're we're instructors <laughs> by our nature and um, we want to teach them what a quantizer is and then they'll know um, so so you know if you do that um do it using metaphors using references to things that people already know about um and do it just once <laughs> right? maybe not a lot yeah you want to reply but i liked to, it you want to reply to that sarah uh, actually quantizer the word quantizer is the core of my research. So I couldn't find a way to just not use quantizer. The mm -hmm. best way I could come up with was to use quantizer, but add an explanation, an easy explanation yeah. so that everyone understands, not completely, but at least have an idea of what quantizer is. And by the way, she's right. And by the way, Erin, you may recall that Daniel Tajik uh, still talks about microwave holography. In his talk, yeah, I guess he does, right? Yeah, microwave holography, yeah, oh yes. Yeah. So, so, so Daniel Tajik is using a jargon as well. Even in his title, right? Microwave yes. holography yes. colon microwave the future of medical imaging. That's correct. Exactly. Exactly. Well, there you are. Yeah, yeah. So I think that that also poses an interesting question, right? Your title is the very first thing that the audience sees, right? They see it even before you walk across the stage as you're being introduced. Someone else reads your title for you. Um, you know, how, how risky is it or not to put jargon in the title? I, I could argue that it sets up attention or it, you know, it tells the audience, you know, here's some tension, here's a word that you don't know, I'm going to resolve it later, or, yeah. you know, here's what you could expect me to explain to you. But on the other hand, it's, it's jargon. Um, you know, does it does it belong in a title? Is it giving them the wrong impression? Well, think of it. Yeah, problems? you know, it's not as engaging as other titles, but yeah. in, a, in a sense, it can be used as a label. So Sarah mm -hmm. is using the idea of quantizer as a label in a certain mm -hmm. sense. So don't worry about what it is, but here's more or less what it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Anyway, I thought the quantizer was very effective, um, that, that explanation. And I always love coming away having learned something. So I don't think any audience member could say that they didn't from that talk. Right. 
I, I, I would have, I think the, the conclusion could have been heightened a little bit if the word brain scan or brain came back into the picture. I, I mm. kind of miss the brain and the brain scan appearing somewhere in the conclusion. Yeah, it seems to me like it's there when you're talking about patients and their artificial arms, right? Like there's what allows them to control it is is the old ticker. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, that, that's true. I mean, it is obviously there indirectly, but the word brain is is missing at the end there. True. So did Danny, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I kind of picked up on the exact same thing. So um, with Quantizer, the key thing I noticed was the redundancy in there. I counted at least six times the word quantizer was used uh, in that speech, which was less than three minutes. Um, and, and then how that is sort of the takeaway from the presentation explaining um, that I'm working on this thing called a quantizer and kind of giving you a little bit of an understanding about it. The other thing I really liked that Sarah did in the presentation was uh, if you notice her hand gestures, she makes really good eye contact, but she also uses her hand gestures and her eye contact to sort of draw your attention. Like when she's setting the levels with her hand, she looks at her hand. The thing I noticed with Mahmoud's presentation was when he does the wave, he doesn't look away. So I, you, I almost, you just sort of see the wave out of your peripheral view. Whereas Sarah is almost like a conductor, kind of giving you an idea of where to focus and where things are going um, when she goes to her presentation, which I really like. Great, good discussion. So audience, audience, any comments, questions, anything jump out at you, any criticism, anything good, bad? Anybody want to unmute and let us know you're there? Okay, well, uh, I think that there, so Danny was the person who chose this, uh, this video um, and uh, we worked on the script and, and kind of putting it into this uh, framework. So let's, let's continue with our presentation. First impressions, the importance of first impressions. Now, if you had a live audience, and of course, uh, even though this is a virtual presentation, uh, you you will be delivering it live, so it 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 will be delivered live to the audience and the judges that might be online. Uh, the the audience will hear your host's introduction of your perhaps the title, perhaps your name, and they may get it wrong. Um, now, if it's in person, they may see you stumble onto the stage. Or if it's virtual, they may hear you say, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Or you're, or you're on mute or your camera's off. All those things, uh, for better or worse, give a certain first impression that's kind of hard to undo. Uh, and again, maybe biased by what they've seen or heard you say, even before you uh, actually utter your first word. Of course, they might not like your slide. Now, they're not going to absorb audience reaction too much on a virtual presentation, but you never know. There may be a lot of thumbs down in the, uh, in the various windows, but hopefully nobody will do that. Um, if it's a live presentation in front of a big audience and all the candidates are lined up, then of course, uh, the judges will already form an opinion about you, most likely if they've been watching the various uh, contestants. So your static slide, keep your static slide simple, you know, develop it first. I, I would strongly suggest your core image, your title, your slide, which in a certain sense represents your core image, uh, really should, should, should be the bedrock of your presentation. Um, they should, the slide should not be a decoration that you add afterwards. To the extent to which it's a decoration that you add afterwards, you're weakening your presentation. So if you develop your script first and then think, oh, I wonder what I can use for a slide, it, it will look like it was an afterthought. <clears throat> Daniel Tadgett's famous blueberry uh, is, uh, and there is his microwave holography, by the way, uh, is, 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 is kind of a classic now. Um, his video has received a lot of hits. 
Now, there are various ways of analyzing this. You can analyze it from a color coordination point of view. His blueberry was, co was coordinated with the Itropoli logos behind him with his blue tie. It went with the blueberry. And of course, the idea of a blueberry in a microwave uh, 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 presentation does seem a little bit odd. And he doesn't refer to that blueberry until at least a minute into his presentation. So the audience had might be looking at this and saying, what's a blueberry doing there? What's a blueberry? It creates tension and creates mystery. And eventually he answers the question. And there is an aha moment for the audience that is really quite good. Uh, sniffing out weapons with microwaves again. And I, this is really a catchy title. And um, uh, this is Aaron Pitcher himself, a picture of him with this bag. Now, you know, when you're sniffing out weapons with microwaves, you could be showing weapons, real weapons or mock-ups of the weapons, plastic weapons. Instead, he creates mystery by kind of suggesting there's something in this suitcase Here, it's the credit is Daniel and, and, and Aaron are given credit for composing, taking the picture. To me, this is one of the best uh, uh, slides that, you know, in recent memory, uh, the video of Kanchu Zhang, which you really should watch, is on YouTube. And um, her opening and closing are absolutely amazing. Her presentation is amazing. Her gestures are amazing. Um, the idea of using a piece of paper with a line on it, uh, one of which is crumpled, the other one which is crumpled and then unfolded. What does that signify? What does it mean? I think that's really classic. Um, anybody want to jump in on any of these uh, slides? Erin, perhaps, or? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I had one comment on Daniel's blueberry slide. Um, I, I had mentioned this during um, during our last webinar on 3MTs, but Daniel chose to include the McMaster University logo. Um, as I understand it, it's not mandatory to include a logo or an affiliation with within an, a, a department's competition because you all know where you're from. Um, but if you're doing this for an external thing, some sort of speaking competition, it can lend you credibility uh, to use an institutional logo on your slide or to just put comma McMaster University after your name. Um, so if, if you're someone um, that has an identity that's been historically marginalized in the sciences and engineering, this might be particularly important to you. Um, if not many people who um, look or talk like you um, are engineers, you might want to lend yourself that credibility um, by, by stating like, hey, I'm, I'm affiliated with this university. But Daniel chose to use the logo. Um, so if you're going to use the logo, um, then your university style guide should tell you exactly what colors appear in that logo and exactly what colors you should be using on any university affiliated um, media that you create. So um, look for like the hexadecimal number, um, look for the CMYK RGB number of the exact color of the logo. And this is what Daniel did here. The purple that's behind his name and title is the same purple as the purple that appears in the McMaster logo. Um, and I uh, would use a metaphor myself in describing how careful you need to be with the details if you're going to do something very simple, right? Um, so, so one, uh, you know, simple things can be very good. I think there, there's somehow an idea that if something is going to be worth doing or, or worthwhile, it should be complicated. But I would challenge you the next time, so you know, you're all grad students. I'm an early faculty member myself. We don't have a lot of money. The next time someone is paying for a meal for you at a very fancy restaurant, choose the simplest thing on the menu. Because if it's a very fancy restaurant, if they're worthwhile and have good chefs, they'll do it very well. And you will never have such a good, simple pasta with garlic and oil in your life. But if you're a chef that's going to make that good, 
you can't use garlic from a can, <laughs> right? You have to use fresh garlic. You have to slice it up. Um, that's to say, you know, Daniel is, is doing something very simple here. He's got one picture on one slide with a title and a logo and a color. You have to get the details right, <laughs> right? You can't make an aglio e olio with, with jarred garlic. Um, you have to use fresh. <laughs> so that's what Dan is doing. My metaphor is that he's using fresh garlic. Thank, thanks, Sarah. And, uh, anyone else want to jump in? Sarah, Danny? Yeah, I, I would just say too, um, make sure you use the slide as an opportunity to, to be creative and to enhance your presentation, right? Because this is the only aid you get when you're presenting. Um, make sure you don't take it for granted and, and put some thought into what you're going to decide to put on the slide or not put on the slide. Yeah. Um, one thing I can add is to start finding a slide for your presentation really at the beginning of the job, because when you get to the end, it's really hard to find something uh, close and uh, reliable to your uh, research. So yeah, I started really fast, really soon. I didn't do that. I And that was my mistake. So I think uh, everybody else maybe should uh, start preparing the slide from the beginning of the workshop. Right, right, absolutely. I uh, really, uh, it really shows. I've, I've, I've worked with people who have uh, started with, have been persuaded to start with a slide, and people who left the slide until the end. Those people who left the slide until the end, sadly, it shows. Now they may do well because their pres their verbal presentation is good, but but that isn't really complemented by the slide unless that slide really forms the core image. By the way, one of the things that you may notice is this picture is taken from a very low position, maybe from the position of a dog. Nobody noticed that before. The idea of sniffing out weapons. Uh, if you were a dog, you would probably be have your nose pretty close to the ground, sniffing, right, Erin? Uh, yeah, I can we, confirm that. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't notice that before. But you know, those little details, they are somehow very subtle. There's a subtext that's often involved and uh, you just don't know how important those things can be. And then again, this uh, iconic picture collecting radio rain uh, by Mahmoud Wagi all those glasses. And of course, he refers to an umbrella, he refers to glasses, he refers to the rain. And so there is that verbal reference to the slide that makes things very clear. So core images, and we've already indicated those, those are in effect core images, those, those uh, uh, slides that you, sh that you saw. For example, memorable, meaningful, and mysterious, the blueberry, a person pulling a suitcase, a line on a crumpled paper, and Aline Eid uh, had a, a tarantula visible, um, water glasses under an umbrella, a wildfire, a guitar. So those seem to be the core images that are within a particular static slide that can be quite, uh, quite powerful. Titles. Catchy but meaningful. Again, coming back to sniffing out weapons with microwaves origami unfolding the future of engineering are we drinking pharmaceuticals where does cancer begin fighting obesity with fat these are all meaningful unexpected surprising memorable sticky if you like um let's look at opening lines now here's something that i kind of re like i i um uh what do i uh, uh, what is the, I forget the word, not transcribe, but um, paraphrased. Maybe, I don't know if that's paraphrased is the right word. Erin can correct me on that. Um, occurring with, with little apparent warning, strokes are a leading cause of disability. Now you could have said there's nothing wrong with that sentence. Occurring with little apparent warning, strokes are a leading cause of disability. But instead, Kan Chu Zhang says, have you, your relatives, your friends ever suffered from a stroke? It has the same meaning in a way. You can think of it as having similar meaning. 
one one immediately one is much more powerful than the other in my view in immediately establishing a contact with the person the more a person undergoes x-rays uh, sorry x-ray scans the greater the risk they will develop cancer daniel tajik could have said that instead he says x-rays cause cancer it's a little unnerving to think about isn't it so the choice of your opening line is really quite uh, quite important um again more opening lines here we don't have to go through them we've seen some of these already closing lines bringing your story full circle here is aline's opening and closing lines uh, her opening line is, hi everyone, I'm Aline from Georgia Institute of Technology, and this is Lucy the Tarantula from the Amazon Rainforest. And indeed, there's a picture of Lucy as the core image in her slide. Um, and then she ends, she ends with this. This will make the environment happier. Sorry, this will make the environment happier. Oh, what about, okay, this will make the environment happier, our environment, and Lucy's. So she returns to Lucy at the very end. So Lucy becomes the focal point. So we think of Lucy as the human interest story in this. Uh, and then Mahmoud Wagi, we've already seen this, the opening and closing lines of Mahmoud. Um, we're coming to the end now, uh, shortly, in terms of the, uh, the, the, the slides that I have to present. Um, be yourself, be sincere, be personal, don't act, don't pretend, kill that fake speech mode. One of the things that when I'm working with people and they start giving a speech, suddenly their tone changes. What I tend to do is to say, okay, let's just talk about what you just did. And we have a little conversation. And I said, you know, when we had this conversation, you're, you're, you, were more, you, you were more authentic, more natural. Can you try to adopt the same speech pattern when you're delivering a speech as when you're having a conversation? Think of this as a conversation with the audience. Appear, converse, appear approachable. Appear, be in the moment and be memorable. With being memorable, of course, of course uh, is... Um, one way of creating a surprise. By the way, Aaron, in that webinar we did on Tuesday, the uh, a, a memorable uh, event was considered to be when somebody lay down on a on the floor in Starbucks. Remember that example, lying down on the floor at Starbucks as a memorable uh, possibility. It occurred to me, why talk about Starbucks and lying down? Imagine you had an in-person three-minute thesis uh, uh, competition or event, and you went and lay down on the stage. That would be memorable. That or would be in, memorable. That would be memorable. <laughs> you want them to remember <laughs> you for the right reasons. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it depends if it's meaningful. Uh, it, it should be meaningful. And, of course, on a virtual thing like this, I mean, we can be slipping down or sliding off the chair onto the floor or have the backdrop collapse on you, or maybe you, you deliberately knock it over, something that may be memorable. Um, well, I mean, I think that that also raises a good point about authenticity, right? Um, if you do something solely for the sake of being memorable, there are no things you could do. You could show up wearing a bright fuchsia sweater and, you know, coloring your face blue or something like that. Um, you could be memorable, but, but are they going to remember your point, right? Your point is to give a research talk. It might be an abbreviated, not very thorough, three minute long research talk to a general audience, but they should be able to come away understanding your research. Um, if your research is somehow related to lying down on the ground, um, then, <laughs> then go for it. That would be an authentic way of being memorable. But authentic, um, authenticity really requires you not to be memorable for its own sake. Right. The other thing so, I, I again, might ask, though, is like, if you were to knock over your background or something, would that be considered a prop? Like, just in terms of the rules for the competition? Well, I mean, you can fake it. I mean, you can yeah. pretend that you didn't mean it to have it happen. 
right? Mm-hmm. How do you how how do you stop that? You have to be in the moment. Uh, but yeah. I, but but you're right. The idea of a prop. We're not in three minute thesis. You're not allowed to use any props. You're not you're not actually allowed to use a script. You're not allowed to read from a script, which presumably also means you shouldn't be reading from the screen. Um, but you know. It, your backdrop, your surroundings, the tie that you may be wearing, uh, whatever your your jacket or lack of it, or rolled up sleeves or not rolled up sleeves, in a sense, they're also props. They become part of your impression, and you can't you can't stop human beings from having an impression. So, last minute tips: make sure your name is repeatable. And we can talk about that uh, again if you want to um, get more details on this. Make eye contact with the audience. And eye contact, I mean, it's how you make eye contact over the internet. Um, imagine if we were having a real conversation right now in person. The t- any, any, any two of us were having a conversation. We were both standing, facing each other, and looking down. Speaking, always looking down, never looking at the other person. That's what we're actually doing right now. On As I look at your faces on my screen, it's, it's be totally unnatural. If you were really there, I should be looking at you there, but I'm looking at you there because that's where I see you on my screen. It's unnatural. Gesture with open hands. Avoid using your finger unless you are counting the number one, two, three, etc. Um, gesture with open hands. Don't don't hold your hand. This is one of the things that I discourage people from doing. Now I've done this a couple of times during our our workshop. Now it's a defensive measure. Don't do that. Don't do this. Keep your hands open, and um, should be all right. The presentation day is at one o'clock on April the 14th. What to expect? Uh, you, will see, you will see a deck of slides, including this as a kind of a filler slide. This will be the introductory slide to your, your three minute thesis slide. And we will provide you with this template. So don't worry about it, you'll be provided with it. It'll be four by three in aspect ratio because we want to create a video like the one that you saw uh, that, that Sarah presented and also Mahmoud Wadi, because we want to have a video that is in, in this 16 by nine, and we don't want the slide to take up too much space or too, particularly not in the aspect ratio. Um, this is the speaker slide four by three to be prepared by you as the speaker and we'll, we'll be uh, sending messages and how to prepare those and uh, uh, we'll, we'll be working on, on, on them in the next few weeks. Then this will be the next filler slide between your slide and the next speaker slide. So it'll be a four by three presentation. We're going to have about three meetings per week. Invitations will be sent to you. You can share your script slides and, and any rehearsals you want to do. Meet with each other, meet with us, come on board. We will all meet as a group. You don't all have to be there all the time, but we'll recommend that you be there as often as you can. You can, uh, we'll help you with the script, with the slides, and we can rehearse, you'll get feedback. And sometimes we'll have one-on-one consultations. Again, some tips, keep the slides simple. One main image if possible, no jargon, no abbreviations. Avoid words except for your name, the, t- the title of the presentation, the citation. This is for the, um, uh, the, the slide, keeping the slide simple. So part of, you can include your name, and you include the title of your presentation on the slide and do include citations, all the sources that you used, including your own photography if appropriate, and put that in a small form. Uh, again, meetings next week, uh, March the 14th, March the 16th, March the 18th, 3 p.m., 9 a.m. We will see most of you then. Uh, the draft four by three slides and scripts are due Monday, March the 21st. And um, we'll send you an email shortly after this webinar. 
or workshop um, with a summary of these particular dates and times. There's a Dropbox up, 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 uh, upload link for drafts in progress, like slides and scripts. Again, you'll get that. And Daniel Shields and I will be available for group meetings and consultation. So with that, I'll say thank you. And uh, let me stop sharing the screen. And uh, again, ask for any questions at this particular time that you might have. A lot of your questions will be answered next week, but please feel free to ask any questions at all. I see most of you have been here the whole time, which is great. It's really nice to see so many of you. And uh, I recognize some of the names there. Um, ask questions and uh, don't be shy. This is one, one great opportunity to ask Sarah and Aaron questions. You won't be seeing them very much after this, uh, unless they want to, Aaron, you'll, you'll, if you want to join any of these rehearsals in progress, by all means. But uh, That reminds me of some advice I have for most grad students I ever meet, and that's that if you are good at something, then, um, <laughs> then you should get paid to do it. I know, Apropos of nothing, just saying. <laughs> If you're good at something, yeah. I mean, I should be getting paid for this. Is that what you mean? Uh, yes, I mean, all of us should be. <laughs> all of us should be getting paid. Yeah, yeah. I know, I know. Uh, any questions? Uh, we've raised an awful lot of different issues. Uh, Aaron and I were on a webinar and which, which discussed all kinds of related material to this. Yeah, somebody had their... Um, another question. I just wanted to mention that uh, I was here with my second laptop from my lab, and the name was Joe, but it was the name of the previous researcher. My name is Esan Abdullah. If there is any attendance list, I wanted to just mention that, yeah. Sorry, I didn't catch that. Uh, yeah. uh, my name of the Zoom meeting was not correct. Oh, right. I correct right now. Oh, okay. Um, I have a question, Dr. Bamford. Oh, yeah, sure, That's Ramina, okay. yes. Hi, um, so uh, I was wondering where should we begin to prepare um, the scenario for our three-minute thesis? I mean, we already, I mean, like, what? where should we begin writing the story of our thesis? And what we Did you say where or when? Where. Where, where should you write it? Uh, um, I mean, where should we begin? Like, um, do we start by generalizing uh, the topic and then try to write a story about it? Uh, because it actually has to be catchy. Yeah. And um, because I don't, I'm not a really good writer, so I don't know how to prepare a good scenario for. Okay. Well, um, my, my, my suggestion is, and I, this is a very good question. I think everybody will have this problem. Imagine you're having a conversation in a coffee shop with, mm -hmm. with a, a long, long time friend that hasn't seen you for a while or a relative, uh, someone, and they just simply say, Ramina, what are you doing these days? And why are you doing it? And what is it? Is it useful for anything? How, what, how would you respond? You know, wouldn't you immediately, well, you might say, You'll never understand what I do, and I, I can't even explain. I can't even begin to explain it. Or you might try to give a metaphor or analogy, or try to relate it. Notice that in the opening lines of some of the presentations we considered, um, the speaker tried to relate immediately with the audience. Mm -hmm. So, so you need to be able to imagine yourself having a conversation. And that's what I, I'll be coming back to that over and over during our meetings. I will say, I will, I will get you, for example, when you, when you present, when you submit your script, I'll get you to read the opening lines and I'll say, imagine I'm your friend. And I'm asking you, so Romina, what have you been up to? And I ask you, so read your opening line. I say, does this, is, is this what you've been up to? So I, I think, you, you'll very quickly get into the mode of composing words, 
um, if you imagine you know, having a conversation, does this feel natural? Mm -hmm. And also the idea of a conversation, when you're having a conversation with someone, you tend to look at them occasionally and see what their reactions are. Now they don't actually have to speak. You can imagine you say something and you can see a kind of a quizzical look on their face. So then you elaborate on this and you see another look. So you elaborate again. In this way, you have this kind of to and fro conversation um, that I think that's the way to begin. Anyway, I've said enough so far. Who else wants to jump in and comment on what Ramin has requested? Um, I think one way to start it is to answer three simple questions and in, in simple ways, like what are you doing, why, and how? And then see how you can expand the idea to be more, uh, more, more like, thorough and simplify it in a sense, right? Yes. Yeah. First of all, start with the, the core points and then try to simplify it, try to make it more catchy, try to add metaphors, try to make it, I don't know, funny mm -hmm. or like have a uh, part of like, I don't know, funny sentence in it to be more engaging or something like that. So my idea for this question would be just to start with simple sentences to explain these three questions and then expand these three. And over time, as you go through these sessions and um, you work on your script, it would get better and better and better. As Dr. Bandler always said, it's going to get better from here. So it's not going to get worse. So. Yeah. And you, you actually, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure it's not going to get worse. I, as I say, some of the early scripts, don't, don't worry about writing a bad script to begin with. And by the way, when we talk about script at this stage, you don't have to write a complete script. You can just write some fragments, some ideas, some phrases, some buzzwords. Don't be afraid of short sentences, one word sentences. Don't try to write these long winded elaborate uh, sentences with, with complex logic that's referring back to something that you said a few phrases ago. Try to be simple, direct, and continuous. And bear in mind that as you write something, you are speaking, you are presenting this as a speech, not as something that people are reading. Because if somebody is reading your script, is actually reading it, if there's something they don't follow or something that isn't clear, their eyes can go back and check out previous words. But in this context of a three minute thesis presentation, nobody can rewind you. Nobody's gonna stop you. Nobody can. So you have to, you have to, you have to put yourself into the, into the mind of the audience and try to, try to um, use, words, phrases, sentences that repeat ideas so that if some core element is missed on the first time around, it may be caught immediately afterwards through repetition rather than having to stop you and rewind you. I don't know if I'm, I'm making any sense yeah. there. Yes, I understand. One thing that I'm really concerned about is reiterate, uh, reiterating other people's uh, three-minute theses, just like Dan's or Aaron's, because um, I'm doing microimaging as well. And if you want to simplify that and you don't want to go into details, like people wouldn't really understand the difference between your work or um, the previous presenters. Um, Erin, do you want to maybe jump in on that or shall I? Yeah, um, that's a really good point, right? Um, when when you're doing a three minute thesis, um, you're, you're having to be understandable to a general audience in just three minutes. So necessarily you won't be able to drill down into the details. Um, you know, it, it might be the case that your presentation sounds rather similar to a presentation that happened before it. Um, I think we've had that happen at the International Microwave Symposium before, where several presenters were trying to make clothing that recycled radio waves, right? I know that um, the, the one that we heard by Mahmoud was doing that, but also D.F. Bital was doing that. Um, John, if you remember D.F. Yeah, 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 of course, of course. Well, um, Aline, Aline Eads is also about 
uh, is about, yeah, exactly yeah. Um, so, you know, we have several that are about very similar general ideas um, that, that, of course, these researchers are doing different parts when you drill down into it. But in three minutes, you can't really drill that far. Um, so I don't think that that's a problem. Um, I, I think no. it probably will happen to you um, that, you know, that, that your research um, may be in a similar field to someone else who's giving a three minute thesis presentation. That doesn't mean that neither of you will win a prize. It doesn't mean that neither of you can give a good talk. Um, you know, the, this, um, this event, I don't know if it's a competition at your university or just an event, but this event um, is just as much to get you to build skills in distilling your research down to be understandable or bringing your research up to be understandable, however you want to think about that metaphor, for a general audience. Um, this is something that will serve you in your professional career well after this event ends for you. Um, so, you know, think of it as not, not a loss if that happens. Um, if the person before you has a topic that's slightly similar, you know how your research is different, but the general audience might not. That's yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, and you know, again, you're having, imagine yourself having a conversation with a relative, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, grandmother, grandfather, uncle, aunt, cousin, uh, people that are technical, non-technical in, in different fields completely. Would they understand what you were saying? And you have to frame it in such a way that they, they have a takeaway from your presentation. One thing you can do is to, is to indicate why you're doing this in the first place. What attracted you to it? Yes. Well, you say, my name is Romina, and I'm really attracted to the idea of imaging. Now, why am I doing imaging? I'm doing imaging to detect breast cancer. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, just I just made this thing up on the spur of the moment. You know, you give your own personal story or your, your own spin on this particular thing. And what is it that attracts you? What are the obstacles? What would be the benefits? Um, yes, thank you. Thank you. They're very good points. Um, thank you all. Yeah, I think too, it's important to recognize like this is a really good opportunity to work on your speaking skills, but also uh, it's kind of a creative exercise. Like when we go into it, you'll see there's a bunch of sort of different ways you can approach it. Like you don't have to approach this presentation in a like a cookie cutter presentation that's exactly three minutes long. Yeah. Right. That's there's like an almost an infinite number of ways you can look at it. Yeah, and by the way, when some of the good presentations, and I, I think to myself, uh, presentations, for example, by uh, Michelle Ogrodnik, a three-minute thesis candidate, and who's also won a number of other sp speaking awards, and Daniel Tajik and Kan Chu Zhang, the, the speaker who had this crumpled paper, the image with the crumpled paper. Other people have followed the template that they have used. They, look, they sort of looked at the sentiments, the words, the phraseology, and you can, you can see from their own presentations that they've almost followed some of these really good presentations as if they were templates, but, not, but templates in the way, in the, in the structure of the script, it's templates in the script, structure of the script, and perhaps even in the gestures. It's difficult when you're talking about radio waves to avoid using this, signal radio wave. Now, if, if Romina, if you're using radio waves for imaging, which of course you are, the question is, can you find some other gesture than this to signal <laughs> radio wave? Yes, yes. I, I think I find something to <laughs> I replace that um, uh, with uh, the, uh, you know, for representing the um, wave signals. Right. Yeah. Any anyone else? Uh, please don't feel shy. I know you are. I mean, I am too. It happens to all of us. But uh, I just want to mention too um, the importance of like coming to the workshops and coming to them early. Don't leave this to the last minute. Last semester, I noticed there was. Uh, a few students that left it right till the end. And it's very noticeable, especially because 
we only have a limited amount of time within these workshops. So we can't really get to everyone if all the students are there. So come early and often to these workshops. Yeah, don't, don't underestimate the time it will actually take you to do this. And uh, it, it's, it, don't underestimate, it's very easy to underestimate and then you scramble at the very end, not realizing. And by the way, writing the script and, and preparing a slide is the beginning. It's the memorization, it's the presentation, it's the rehearsals. The, the gestures that you might want to build in. A lot of this stuff happens organically as you further and further develop your, uh, your stage presence. And one of the things that I've, we've all noticed, and Danny's obviously noticed this, and Aaron would have noticed this as well, is that at the very beginning, candidates can sound quite awkward and stilted and, and um, uh, shy. And as, as uh, Tim Davidson was saying, you know, after doing this over and over and over again and getting feedback, they amaze themselves with what they've achieved. That's what I, I think that's, for me, the biggest takeaway. And one of the reasons I'm doing this is I see, I see in minute by minute improvement in, uh, in scripts, in slides, in presentation skills. Um, there's a lot to it. And again, Tim Davidson put his finger on it when he said this may be the most cost effective way of changing your career. That's how he put it or words to that effect. Dr. Bandler, I have a quick question. Sure. Um, so in terms of the script, um, actually my uh, research project has targeted fabrication of um, smart sensors for uh, monitoring the quality of the food. So I'm sure that before me, there were uh, some students in EC who have worked on the same project. So if uh, the script that I uh, wanna work on has some similarities with the other students, that have presented before, then uh, it would be fine or no? I should avoid having... Um, oh, well, how, in what way would the scripts be similar? When the subject may be similar, but are the scripts going to be similar? In some parts of the script, maybe uh, there would be some, some similarities. Well, listen, one of the things that I've noticed is we have a huge automotive research group and center in our in our department and it seems to me like almost every student is doing something on with electric vehicles and uh and you know they in a in a certain sense there is a tremendous similarity in some and overlap in those presentations but again they all find different ways of expressing that you, you you'll be amazed every individual person will express themselves differently you know, you may start. You may start thinking that this is very similar to another script, but as the script evolves, you'll see that it'll deviate from what you started with originally. There's a divergence rather than a convergence, I, I believe. Yeah, I think too. You'll be surprised. The script you start with and the script you end with, you may not even be able to tell that they were the same. Like the, the amount, some scripts from the beginning to the end, yeah. you wouldn't know. There's maybe not even a word that's the same. Right. Yeah, it makes sense, thank you. Yeah, you know, I, I often think to myself, I should record somebody delivering their first script and record that and then and then show it to them at the very end and say, this is before and this is after. Uh, but, you know, the before can be quite embarrassing. So. So I, 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 I've sort of resisted uh, that temptation of, of uh, doing a before and after. Um, Aaron, I don't know if you're speaking, you're, you're, you're muted. I'm not sure if you're, I can't, we can't hear you if you're speaking. Uh, no, I, I, um, I, I'm really glad that you did not record anyone's before version. I think that would kind of be cruel and unusual. Um, yeah, that, that is definitely cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, but but very know. instructive, you know, I even the scripts, it's some of the some of the scripts you see at the beginning are cringeworthy. 
Okay, but don't worry about it. it you know, it's difficult. It's not as easy as you think. Mm -hmm. It can be cringeworthy, but they just somehow get better. They evolve. They, they'll, they'll evolve as you hear, as you, if you come to these workshops, they'll evolve as to hear other people presenting their work, or you'll hear other scripts. And what I will do, um, what Danny and I will do is we'll, we'll, have, we'll share a screen, somebody's script, and we will edit this in real time. We will look at certain words and phrases, and we'll say, look, look, look what happens when I change this from this word or phrase to this word or phrase. Or look what happens when we delete this chunk completely. And other people watching this editing process in action will learn from this. And, and they do. It's amazing uh, how, how, how effective that can be when you see the editing process in real time. Sorry, another question regarding the presentation, if that's okay. Um, so I was wondering if the presentations, um, do we have to upload videos of ourselves or uh, is it going to be online? No, no, it'll all be, it'll all be live online. Okay. What we do, what will happen is, is uh, Danny and I will collect all your final slides. We will put the slides into a deck and we will be responsible for showing those slides at the appropriate time. All you have to do is to show up like you are right now mm -hmm. and uh, we'll get everybody to turn their cameras off. Your camera will be the only one that's on and you will present live to the audience that's, 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 that's watching. Yeah, you'll just see your slide and then a three minute timer on your slide and right. your video. Mm -hmm. Right. So you, you'll deliver it live and what will happen, we will record it live and uh, we may, uh, we'll, 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 we'll take selected videos and, up, and process them and upload them to YouTube later yeah. on. The only thing you didn't see was um, Dr. Bruce or Dr. Davidson will introduce you, check that your microphone and video are working. And right. then when you're ready to start, we'll start the timer. We'll yeah. Yeah. I mean, imagine, for example, imagine that Aaron Kylie was the next speaker. Um, Sarah, myself, Danny and everybody else will have their their videos off, microphones off. And while Erin is making her three minute presentation and she will be the only person visible, there will be a shared slide that the rest of the audience will see while she is speaking. Okay, I see, thank you. Yeah. This is not how we did this for the uh, microwave symposium for the last couple of years. Uh, th that was done differently. The, the I recorded the videos uh, on, with, you know, in one-on-one -on -one sessions with everybody and then processed them into a YouTube ready video uh, a collection of YouTube ready videos that were rolled out to the judges all at the same time. So that was, that's different from what we're doing in the department here. They were pre recorded, and in our department, it'll all be live. Any other questions? We'll wrap up in a couple of minutes. Thanks, Erin and Sarah, for staying for so long. I really really makes a difference. I mean, your presence uh, really just kind of uplifts this and uh, gives us some credit, gives Danny and me some credibility. Yeah. <laughs> well, anything that can uplift grad students who are still mired in the thick of it, um, you can do yeah. it. Um, the end is coming soon and uh, it's more work afterward, but, um, but you're going to get through it. Yeah. And you know, you may actually have fun. It's hard work, but it's actually fun as well. Yeah, and all and all the time while you guys are doing it, I always say to myself, "Thank God I don't have to do this." <laughs> yeah, yeah. By the way, I tried to make a three MT about my own research, and John knows how well that went. <laughs> you, you, yeah. And I've done, I've tried to do one about my work. I've been challenged several times to do a three-minute thesis about my research, and 
it's impossible. I can't do it. And for all these workshops that you and I have done for three minute thesis students, no one has ever asked us, have we done one ourselves? If, if they did, the answer would be no from both of us and they could call us hypocrites. <laughs> No, of course. I mean, we're, we're imposing this on other people, but we, 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 we stand clear. Oh, I know. Classic professor move. I mean, you'd have to do a three-minute thesis on centering, right, Aaron? Yeah, and I remember coming up with a draft script. You, you asked me, do you want to do this as an exercise? And my script tried to, you know, tr tried to do um, exactly with centering what Sarah tried to do with quantizer. And I failed to explain what centering was, I think, to a general audience. <laughs> but Sarah succeeded with quantizers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, listen, if, if, there's no, if there are no more questions, um... Danny and I look forward to seeing as many of you as possible next week. So thanks again to our visitors, guests. And good luck. We all need luck, right? Luck. So <laughs> thanks so much, everyone. Let's bring this to a close and speak. Thank very you, Thank for, you for inviting us. Yeah, it's been nice to be here. Happy Friday. Happy weekend. Good luck on everything, including the 3MT, but also everything. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.